Hello, everyone, and welcome to lesson number 13 in the present word curriculum. We are the meeting room Sunday school class at Waverly Road Presbyterian Church. And this will be our last lesson in the winter curriculum workbook. We will be discussing Lydia and her call to hospitality and service to Paul and his fellow travelers in Macedonia and the early church. Next week, we will begin the spring curriculum. And the topic for that quarter will be prophets, faithful to God's covenant. And lesson number one will be on Moses, prophet of deliverance. So we hope everyone can join us again next week. Um, before we begin today's lesson, let's go to God in prayer. Dear gracious God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you for this opportunity to gather today by technologies that allow us to do so. And we just ask that you open our hearts and minds to what you have to say to us through our author, through each other, and through your word in the scriptures. Today, we ask that you open our hearts to use our resources hospitably and help us see the people you are calling us to welcome. We ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Jack, you want to? Okay, us off I'll take it. it sure. Yes, yes, sir. Well, before we begin our lesson today, I would like to circle back to last week for just a minute. Uh, last week, you'll recall I mentioned the outstanding women staff members of Waverly Road Church. But I inadvertently forgot about a very outstanding woman on our staff, and that is Amy Boyce. Uh, I think we can all agree that Amy is an outstanding professional woman, a member of our staff. She manages our office quite well, as well as all communications functions. So we didn't mean to leave her out, and now we've included her. And now on to today's lesson. Our lesson today, uh, the author, Reverend Lynn Babb, she introduces it by referring to hospitality. She uses the reference to hospitality uh, to introduce the hospitality of Lydia to Paul and his followers. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the lesson. You know, hospitality, I think, is one of those concepts that may vary from uh, place to place and time to time, but uh, we usually recognize hospitality when we see it. Uh, the word comes from medieval English. The word is hospitali, and it meant the reception of guests for lodging. Uh, another word that I've wondered about before was the word hospital. Uh, and I looked that up and the word hospital has a connect connotation to the word hospitality. It comes from the Latin word hospitalio, and in the early church, the word hospitalio meant a place where pilgrims to the Holy Land could stay and be cared for as they traveled. So from that word, we get the word hospital today, which has a totally different meaning. Well, both Jesus and Paul had a lot to say about hospitality. So Barbara, what would you say about telling us about Jesus and hospitality? Okay. Uh, you're on mute, you're on mine. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Had I, iPad muted, but didn't think about the iPad, so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, sorry. In Matthew 10, 5 through 14, Jesus was getting ready to send out the disciples, and he gave us some instructions. One of the things he said was, don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. He had given the disciples the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cure leprosy, and cast out demons. They were to depend on the hospitality of the people since they were not to take any money in the money belts, take any extra clothes, a walking stick, or anything. They were going to go to a house 
and search for a worthy person and stay in that home. And when they first got there, they were going to give that home a blessing. And if it wound up that ended up being a worthy home, the blessing stood. Otherwise, when they left, they withdrew the blessing. And one thing that I thought was interesting, he told them that when they left the town, if it hadn't been hospital, to dust their feet, to shake the dust from their feet. And that was a common practice of disdain in that area, that it was a visible protest that signified that they regarded the place no better than the plague and land, pagan land. So he told, he more or less had his disciples to depend on hospitality, which would be scary to me today. <laughs> well, let's move over to Paul and Howard. What did Paul have to say about hospitality? You are no. mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul had a lot to say about hospitality throughout his epistles, but today I'm going to read Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And in the New Revised Standard Version, the heading for this passage is Marks of the True Christian. Paul says, Let love be genuine, hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Very powerful message from Paul, wasn't it? Yes. Well, our lesson today about Lydia uh, takes place in the 16th chapter of Acts. And I think before we jump into that passage about Lydia, it helps us to start at the beginning and understand where Paul is coming from, who he's involved with. So, Bart, would you talk about Timothy and the beginning of the 16th chapter? Okay. Paul had gone to Derby and the Lystra and met the young man, Timothy. He was estimated to be in his late teens or early 20s. His father was a Greek and his mother was a Jewish believer. He was highly regarded by the believers in that area, so Paul wanted him to join him on the missionary journey. And in the, before he left, in order to please the Jews, he was circumcised. But the main thing by, I think that helped pick him was that he was both Gentile and Jew. So he had access to both cultures and would be indispensable except for serving in this missionary field. Okay, young Timothy, he had quite an influence on the early gospel, I think. Well, under what circumstances did Paul end up in Philippi, which is where we encounter him with Lydia, and Howard will tell us about Paul's journey to get there. Howard? I will, and, and the journey is described um, throughout Acts 16, but I'm going to read a passage from verses 6 through 12, and then talk a little bit about 
um, the vision that Paul had. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. So it always amazes me to read about the, the travels of Paul and, and his companions. Um, it's not like they could jump on a bus or a, fire up a, a Volkswagen van or, or get on a plane and zip around. They were doing it all by foot and by boat. Um, and so they covered a lot of ground. Um, to me, what's most powerful about this passage is, is Paul having a vision and hearing from God through that vision to go to Macedonia. Um, it raises the question, does God speak to us today in the way he spoke to Paul? And I personally believe I have heard from God a few times since I came to faith um, 16 years ago. Um, as many of you know, when I first came to faith, I was led and greatly influenced by the writings of Dallas Willard, um, one of my favorite contemporary theologians. He passed away a few years ago. But he wrote a book that's now titled Hearing God, Developing a Conversational Relationship with God. And I still refer to that book occasionally. But what I learned most from Dallas was how does God speak to us today? And he said there are four primary ways that, that God speaks to us. Um, the first, of course, is the written word, the Bible the scriptures, the canon, um, however you, you want to describe it. But it's the writings of the Jewish fathers and then the early church fathers describing their own encounters with God and others who they met who had encountered God. Um, the second way is through the Spirit of God within us. Um, in First Kings... Some translations call it the still, small voice. Um, Samuel heard it in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3 um, as a gentle whisper. Um, it, it's our own inner conscious, what we hear in our minds speaking to us that, that is coming from the Spirit of God. The third way is the creation around us, or as Dallas called it, our communicating cosmos. Nature speaks to us in very real, visual, and verbal ways through the sights and sounds that God created in the universe. Um, and he can speak to us through, if you've ever driven across Chestnut Ridge on Memorial Boulevard at sunrise, um, God has spoken to you. Um, and, and so the fourth way is each other. We hear God through other human beings. Um, we all experience God in different ways and at different times and staying connected with each other as we're doing in this Sunday school class and at Waverly Road and, and the church in the world. Um, we share our experiences in life and it's a way that God communicates with us um, through other people. And so the key to hearing God these days is keeping all of these avenues of connection with him open and in balance. Very good. 
Thank you. Well, so we come to Lydia, uh, the main subject of today's lesson. And uh, the first thing I would say is that Lydia is not a stranger to us. You know, we have in this class over many years studied the book of Acts. And uh, in studying the book of Acts, we have encountered Lydia. She's always there. I uh, think she's one of the strongest women witnesses to the good news of the gospel in the New Testament. So most of what we, most of what we will say today may be familiar, may be just a refresher, but there may be some new gems of information about Lydia. We'll just see. She was uh, born in the Greek city of Thyatira, which is in Asia Minor. It was in Greece at the time. And believe it or not, this city still exists today in central Turkey. It is now known as Akasar, A-K-I-S-A-R. It's a bustling city of about 30,000 inhabitants, uh, very much a touristy type city, according to the information that I uh, read about. Uh, Thyatira, during Lydia's time, according to Greek historians, was the textile capital of the Roman Empire. Not sure why it was that, but it was. And many types of cloth were made in Thyatira. Uh, the most coveted cloth, of course, was the purple cloth. And we've always heard Lydia, the Lady of Purple. Uh, the purple cloth was obtained by extracting a purple chemical known as murex from a type of seashell that existed in the seas around uh, the Adriatic Sea. Uh, it was a very expensive type of dye because of the labor involved in obtaining that much uh, chemical from those sea urchins. Another less expensive dye was brilliant red. And it was also produced uh, in and around Thyatira from a plant root which was known as the matter plant, M-A-D-D-E-R. The significance of these dyes and these, the dyed cloth was that Lydia, as we know from Acts, was a seller of purple cloth. Perhaps she also sold red cloth, but purple is mentioned because of its expensive nature. She was a Greek woman. She was not a Jew. Uh, she had a bustling business selling cloth, and she located her business in the busy port city of Philippi. Uh, we don't really know if Lydia was married. It's not mentioned that she was or wasn't, uh, but she was definitely an astute businesswoman, which is unusual for that uh, day and time, I think. Uh, Acts tells us that she was a worshiper of God, which is also quite interesting. She was not a Jew, and although she was not a Jew, she had become attracted and attached to a group of Jewish women there in Philippi, and she worshiped the God Jehovah uh, while she was living there in Philippi. Well, when Paul and Timothy and Silas and the other traveling evangelists reached Philippi, as Howard had told us, uh, they did something that they did every time they got to a new city, they would find the local synagogue and they would go to the Jewish synagogue where they thought there was very fertile ground for witnessing on behalf of Christ. Uh, this was usually someone's house. Synagogues as a general rule in that part of the world didn't have big separate buildings, but they would meet in any house where there were at least 10 Jewish men wanting to worship together. The women could come also, but you had to have 10 Jewish men to have a worship service. So when Paul and his followers looked for a synagogue in Philippi, they apparently didn't find one, but they were led down to the riverbank where there were a group of Jewish women worshiping at that particular time. And among this group of Jewish women was Lydia. So as Paul and his uh, followers proclaimed the message of Christ, the Bible tells us that it opened Lydia's heart and she believed 
and she basically became baptized there in the river and had everyone in her household baptized. Now, we don't know who all that was. It certainly probably included servants, maybe some family members, maybe employees in her business, but they were all baptized by Paul and his followers. She did a very unusual thing, which Barbara's going to tell us about, after she became baptized in the faith. And Barbara, tell us about hospitality. Okay. Like you said, after she was baptized, she asked Paul and the ones traveling with them to be guests in her home. She even said, if you agree that I am a true believer, you will come and stay at my house. So she kept urging them until they did go and stay in their, her house. It makes me wonder, uh, what does it take, do you think, to be a, a hospitable Christian today? Any ideas? One that yeah. appeals to me is it, uh, what we do there with Promise Keepers, uh, IHN, at our church, by inviting people we don't really know, families, to come into the church and spend a week around the clock uh, at night, feed them, give them meals. To me, that's a type of church hospitality. Uh, and I've met uh, the times that Erlene and I have provided meals there, uh, met some very interesting people, some sad stories, some encouraging stories. Any other ideas? So for, for me, one is just being a good neighbor <laughs> wherever you live. I, I'm very blessed to live in a very nice neighborhood um, in Sullivan County and, and have several neighbors that, that we are, some of them we've known for 25 years. So most of them are fairly new arrivals to the neighborhood. And, and I think sometimes um, just waving to them as you walk by or, or speak to them and, and just welcome them to, to living next door to you and being mm -hmm. friendly and, and not griping when they don't pick up the litter in the yard or when the dogs bark too loud or, or just being friendly and nice about everything and, and treating yeah. them with, with respect. Good. Good point. Okay. Well, the last thing about our lesson is that the writer includes a passage of Paul's writing from 1 Corinthians, and we'd like for Howard to tell us about that, how it applied to Lydia, and how it might apply to us today. So, Howard, have a go with that one. All right. So, I'll be reading first from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. And Paul tells us, consider your own call, brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Mm. And, and so for me, it's very interesting, as, as Jack alluded to, the, the history of Lydia. Um, she grew up in, in Thyatira, which, which was, as Jack said, in Western Turkey, now not too far from Philippi. Um, the province where Thyatira was located was the province of Lydia. And so she was named after her hometown or her home region. And at that time, it was common for slaves to be named after their birthplace. And so there's no reason to think that Lydia was a former slave, but it's a possibility. 
Um, and, and in the culture of that time, it would not be uncommon for someone named after where they were born to, to have been a former slave. Obviously, um, as Jack mentioned, she was an astute businesswoman and, and was now a free Greek and, and running a successful business, obviously successful and wealthy enough to have a home big enough to invite a group of travelers to, to stay with her. Um, but whatever her origins and circumstances, she was a grand example of someone who did, did not boast about herself, but only about what God, God had called her to. Um, as Jack and Barbara both mentioned, and I'll read now from, from Acts, the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. And so she wasn't saying, I've got a great big old house. I'm a rich lady, come spend time with me. She was saying, the good Lord has provided me and I would like to be hospitable to you with the blessings he's given us. And, and so I think today we should all be so humble and hospitable. Everything we have is from God. Through the examples of Jesus and Lydia and Paul and really all the disciples and apostles of the early church, God has shown us that sharing our lives, our possessions, and our love with each other and those that we meet is what being a Christian is all about. And Lydia was, was one of the first great examples of that. Good. Okay, folks, that brings to a close our lesson for today. So we are going to end with a closing prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that the Holy Spirit that spoke to Lydia so many years ago speaks to us today. That when we gather in your name, it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that is there that unites us. We pray for the members of this class. We pray for Waverly Road Church. We pray for the time when we may gather again together in person and feel that presence of your spirit amongst us. We thank you for the word that we are able to study. We thank you for the technology that allows us to disseminate these comments to others. We pray that you would bring us back safely again this next week as we embark on another study of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, folks. See you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a good week. Same to y'all.